forgives all our sins. His mercy is over forever. <laughs> Hear the commandments of God for his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. book of 
Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set up. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. <coughs> Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. <coughs> Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Aliyah and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping of the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. He sat and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Rome. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
the reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Jesus saw a man blind from birth. 
His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud in my eyes, then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened, he said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been born blind. And they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want me to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus opened his eyes. There was a discussion among the Pharisees. They questioned the man a second time. He told them that the man who opened his eyes was a prophet. But they called him a sinner and accused the man who was blind of being his disciple. Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken through Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. 
If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Lord. of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I'm hearing that about half of you made it into the um, church without getting either of these. Um, would one person from each row kind of take a um, toll and, and see um, how many might be needed in that row and come up and get them down? I think that's the easiest way. teacher for 40 years, so you're going to have handouts every now and then, <laughs> so be forewarned. When you walk through the doors, uh, take a look and see what's there. If there's something other than the leaflet for the day, uh, please grab it. Let me, um, let me respond to the gospel by reading to you a short article that I wrote a few years back. Now I entitled it as None Can See. Some time ago, in an airing of the Osgood file, a frequent CBS radio feature for decades, Charles Osgood marveled over a man who, blind 50 years since childhood, was able to have his sight restored through surgery. Apparently, he had long since been convinced by the medical experts of his day that his condition was irreversible. But at the urging of his friends, he decided to place his hopes once more on those who felt that, through improved methods, he may still have a chance to see. 
they were right. The response of the man was indeed marvelous. He spoke of sight as if it were heaven. The reality of seeing was far greater than anything he had remembered or even fantasized about. Having thought of the grass as a carpet, he was surprised to discover that one could actually distinguish individual blades of grass. His every movement was spent in childish delight and sober thankfulness for his gift. When asked what his most startling discovery was with his new ability, he replied, I never realized yellow would be so yellow. <laughs> with his listeners, now rejoicing with him over the profound simplicity of such an innocent observation, Charles Osgood provided them with even a greater meaning for the event. Isn't it interesting, he said, that a man who was unable to see as others could, now can see as no other can. And so it is with those whose spiritual blindness is wiped away by the great physician. Whereas once counted as those who, though having eyes could not see, and though having ears could not hear, now are made aware by the enlightenment of grace of the marvelous glories of the manifest riches of Christ in God. The previously mundane takes on new meaning and purpose. Is it the surgery or is it the blindness that makes for such ultimate joy? Surely both. A former rector of mine was fond of saying, this is a perfect world for the work of redemption. In speech, we call those pregnant pauses. Just as a diamond merchant displays his wares against black velvet, God gives us the light of Jesus in a dark world. It is only in that setting that those who comprehend can truly see as no other can. I'm going to have to take back one of the eight and a half by eleven sheets. <laughs> I'm one of those who passed it up. Can you can you um, look on with somebody else? Back in Missouri, we have a phrase called uh, "talking turkey." I don't know if you all talk turkey down here, I, I bet you do, but it means getting down to business, and I want to get down to business with you today. I have no idea how long I will be with you, but I can tell you that there has already been some humor about my being a permanent temporary. <laughs> um, but it occurs to me that all priests are permanent and temporary. All churches are permanent and temporary. So with your permission, for as long as I'm here, I'm going to do my best to be a full service priest. That means bonding as much with you as possible for as long as I can. When I was an engineering student at Washington University in St. Louis, and was called into the ministry, I knew what I was giving up, and I've never looked back. I've never been sad about that, um, that opportunity, that decision. And it's with joy that I serve before you. It is with joy that I serve God by serving you. Save this for a moment, and let's go to the eight and a half by 11 sheet. I've called this possible priest presence 24 seven. I live alone, except for my cat. By the way, I want to apologize to you cat people. I told you a couple of weeks ago that I'm not a cat person. Well, I am now, I acknowledge, and I confess to you that I do love my cat. <laughs> And no, I haven't been chastised because of that, but I'm chastising myself. So 
I know I've gotten into enough trouble in the past to know when to, uh, when to sidestep something. Um, but I can tell you that that cat doesn't care when I leave and when I get back, except at feeding time. <laughs> so I don't have to explain my comings and goings to anybody. I don't know why God made me the way he did, but I can fall asleep anywhere, anytime. And if you wake me up, I am happy because that means I get to fall asleep again. <laughs> In the middle of the night, all you do is turn your pillow over and it's a nice cool pillow and you fall asleep a second time or a third or a fourth. I know that that's not the case with most human beings, but it is with me. And for that reason, I feel comfortable being on call 24-7. Now, I am the chaplain at St. James Place, a retirement community, and I do sometimes uh, serve in those wee hours of the morning, and it's, it's no problem for me. But I want to tell you that you are in second place, and that if I'm not doing something, and you need me, or need my services, or need to talk to me, Call me. My phone wakes me up, and I'll say to you, I'm glad you woke me up because I get to go right, right back to sleep again. <laughs> Do you understand that? Okay. So, if you just want to ask questions and hear answers, not that I have all of them, not that I have many of them, and one of my answers will be I don't know. But if you, if you have questions, call me. If you want to meet with me, let's do it. I saw an IHOP on the way in this morning. I, th I guess they're open 24-7. If you want to have discussions on baptism, confirmation, reception, and reaffirmation, those are the four areas that the bishop administers to uh, when the bishop comes. And by the way, Bishop Duckworth is coming here to grace in September. I would like for us to have some folks ready for her, and I know that we've already got a class going uh, by uh, John, and um, uh, that's a good thing, uh, but there might be other instances in which you want to catch up with that class, or there might be instances in which you, after that class is over, want to learn by yourself. Call me, we'll work it out somehow. I will be uh, happy to hold classes, either in this uh, venue here or uh, at your home. <coughs> if there is a serious accident or a serious situation that causes someone to go to uh, ER, call me. Uh, but sometimes I make it to ER before the, um, the ambulance does at St. James Place. I, I like doing that. I am available for hospital visitations, and I would imagine that some of your relatives and loved ones uh, and friends end up in Baton Rouge one time or another. That would be a very easy thing for me to do, that I can also drive to Hammond at any time of the night. This little booklet called Administration at the Time of Death is what we affectionately call Last rites. I put it in quotation marks because that is not a book of common prayer term. And there are some, uh, some priests who get upset when we use it. But uh, I think it's a, a, a pretty fair uh, thing of, of what's going on. We're going to look at that in a moment. If you want a priest present at celebrations, graduations, award ceremonies, family gatherings, school performances, or whatever, call me. If you are in need of some kind of counseling, I do not have the credentials of a psychologist or a trained counselor or, of course, a psychiatrist, but I can certainly uh, direct you to uh, the, the appropriate people, sometimes in the Episcopal Church, who do hold those credentials. And indeed, um, having lived as long as I do, I might have some good advice for you myself, so um, take advantage of that. I will try to attend as many church functions here as possible. We had a 
wonderful recital here yesterday, and if you're missing Joliet, it's because she's gone. And she says she might come back on various occasions in the future. We'll look forward to that. And other fun stuff. Whatever I don't uh, uh, list here, uh, try it and see what happens. And you're going to hear this verse quoted by me often. It's from Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. I had a, an Old Testament professor at Florida Christian College in Tampa, Florida, who called this his favorite verse. And I looked it up, and since that time, this has been my favorite verse. And I'm going to quote from a, a, a version that's not the one listed here, but uh, as we grow, verbs, versions change. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, that's the Holy Spirit, Unto him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus unto all generations forever and ever. I've said call me several times. If you look on the back of this, you'll see my card. You'll also see a little red line that crosses through my office phone because I'm rarely in my office. And if you call after 2 o'clock on a Friday and leave a message and think I'm going to get it before Monday noon, you're wrong. So I've also got my cell phone here that wakes me up anytime um, I have been beckoned by it. Now, what I want to do with you uh, is to follow this. It's about a five-minute uh, exercise. But let me tell you, first of all, that the Episcopal Church is not afraid of the word death. When I taught English, I ran across an article that said Americans are the worst in the world in their denial of death. We have over 140 euphemisms for death. Cashing in chips, pushing up daisies, bought the farm. We just can't say it, even passed away. As obviously frank as that is, it's not the word death. The shortest verse in the Bible is John 11, 35, which says Jesus wept. But he wept at the home of Lazarus, his good friend, the brother of Mary and Martha, and was about to raise him from the dead. So why would he cry, not just cry, it doesn't say he teared up, it said he wept. If he knew he was going to do something like that, I suggest to you that death is that serious. Death is a reminder that evil wins, maybe temporarily, but evil wins for a period of time. And it moved Jesus. So I suggest to you that because of the resurrection, we have the ability to look death in the eye and to call him by name. And say, death, you make us grieve. You bring us to our knees. You even made Jesus weep. But know this, that we own you. Because Paul said that God, with the strength of his might, raised Jesus from the dead and made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name of his name, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And then Paul in another place said, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who are left shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then Paul says, Wherefore, comfort one of these with these words. They are the most comforting words of Scripture. They are the most comforting words in any language, period. 
And it's because we have power over death. As I mentioned to you, I'm the chaplain of a retirement center. The average age there is 86.1 and getting higher because people are living longer. I'm still one of the young kids on the block. I want to read this with you and to you. I want you to respond by saying the italics. When someone is in dire straits, and this first paragraph will let you know what that means. When a person is near death, the minister of the congregation should be notified in order that the ministrations of the church may be provided. Almighty God, look on this, your servant, lying in great weakness, and comfort him, and of course the italics there means also comfort her, with the promise of life everlasting given in the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before I start reading uh, on the next page, let me tell you that one of our residents died at 9.30 Tuesday morning. I'm sorry, Thursday morning while I was preparing the altar for my regular um, Eucharist service for the Independent Living Bunch. We have three different places on campus, Independent Living, Assisted Living, and Health and Wellness, which is our hospital. And I received word that she had just died. And I immediately put a sign on my office door because that's currently being used as uh, our chapel because of our renovation that's going on that I'd be back in a few minutes, just have a seat. And I went down and found uh, one of our nurses and um, also her son, who was visiting from another state. And I asked permission to do this with them. And as I started, Raven Horse Funeral Home came in and started doing what they do. And they were kind enough to pause and let me finish to the glory of God when that happened. So think about her, think about that family as we go through this quick reading. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, one God, from all evil, from all sin, from all tribulation. By your holy incarnation, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, we sinners beseech you to hear us, Lord Christ, that it may please you to deliver the soul of your servant from the power of evil and from eternal death. That it may please you mercifully to pardon all his sins. May it please you to grant him a place of refreshment and everlasting blessedness. That it may please you to give him joy and gladness in your kingdom with your saints in light. Jesus, Lamb of God. Jesus, bearer of our sins. Jesus, redeemer of the world. Lord, have mercy. Lord have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver your servant, O Sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil, and set her free from every bond, that she may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Depart, O Christian soul, out of this world. In the name of God the Father Almighty who created you, in the name of Jesus Christ who redeemed you, in the name of the Holy Spirit who sanctifies you. May you rest be this day in peace and your dwelling place in the paradise of God. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, 
we commend your servant. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. May her soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Between the years of 64 and 70, while I was a student at um, LSU and had a family, all three of my children were born in um, Baton Rouge during those years. I was a minister for a fundamentalist Protestant church, a non-charismatic fundamentalist Protestant church. And I became good friends with a gentleman that I had to leave in 1970, just I had to leave the church. Yeah, I was only there for six years. I was temporary, didn't know it, but I was. And went back to St. Louis. About six months later, his wife called and said that Don is dying. And I said, I'm on my way. I went straight to the hospital and to his room. And as I came to the door of his room, his wife put up a hand, brought me out into the hall, and said, don't tell him he doesn't know. So I drove nearly 600 miles so that I could talk to him about the food, the nurses, the view from his window, and St. Louis Cardinal baseball. He was a Cardinal fan. Now, do you think for a moment that he didn't know why I was in town? <laughs> It's a, it's a fraudulent thing that we used to do. It was a conspiracy between both the medical professions and the family, not to say anything. But thanks be to God that we have something that has really mushroomed since then called hospice. Now I know there are reasons to go on hospice that are not fatal in their prediction. But most of the time when you're on hospice, the, the cure is no longer the goal, the comfort is the goal. And it usually isn't very long until that person dies. So hospice has helped us say to the family, it's time to start thinking about last rites. It's time to start thinking about saying goodbye. I wanted to tell him how much he meant to me. I wanted to ask him if there was anything I could do for his children. wanted to tell him how incomplete my life would now feel without him without knowing that he's rooting for the Cardinals every time I, I didn't get that chance and make no mistake about it I've been looking forward to the moment to share this liturgy with you, which, by the way, one of my 
uh, parishioners put in a very uh, attractive, foldable piece of paper, it's exactly what's in your Book of Common Prayer. But this is easy to hand out, it's easy to walk into a hospital room with a family assembled and use it. It allows us to say goodbye. It allows us to respect the dying so much that we're not afraid we're going to offend them. I mean, dying is not something that happens to some of us, it happens to all of us. Let's accept that. And one of, the, one of the most important things you will ever call on me to do, I don't know if there's anybody in your family right now who is close to uh, the administration at the time of death, but there might be. One of the most important things you would ever ask me to do is to lead you in this five minute prayer service, in these last rites. It would be my joy, it would be my honor to do so. Don't forget that. You've got my phone number right on the back of the liturgy. I know I have overspent my time. I'll, I'll promise to cut some in the future. Um, but I can tell you that this is all good news to me. And I share it with you this morning in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally the God of the Father, God of God, life for light, true God for true God, be God of one.
Give your power of healing to those who minister to their needs. Give our For all who have died in the certain hope of the resurrection and eternal life, especially Gus, Tommy, Sam, and Louise, and for those who love them, grant that our death we may enter with joy into your eternal kingdom. We give thanks for the presence in our midst of Doris Wingfield, Carson Wiles, Clayton Reagan, James Mayfield the Fourth, Nicholas Tucker, Will Anderson, and Lucy Miller, all of whom celebrate their birthdays this week, and we pray for God's richest blessings upon each of them in the coming year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace. Hear us, O Lord, for bounteous is your kindness and mercy. We earnestly implore your divine goodness. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to the apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. <clears throat> Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God.
be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and his grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you're fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world of peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Keep us your family, Lord. We will never fail in mercy that relying solely on the help of your heavenly grace, they may be upheld by your divine protection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.